we're good. Is that live? We are live. Hi, we're live. We're sorry, we're just a little bit late to uh, today. Um, welcome to the Comics Experience Book Club meeting for uh, for April, twenty sixteen. No, May. May. Yes, the, this is the May book. This is the May book. I don't know because seven months we you know. I get confused. I'm juggling so many months with this. Um, and the book this month is Lucy Nisley's um, Something New, um, which is a, a fantastic book um, that we all love very much. We all love this very much. Yes? Yeah, yeah they all loved it very much. Um, uh, we're here with our, our lovely in store people. Also, people theoretically watching on the internet, though, you know, since we just started late, I'm not sure that they're there. Um, but I want to I wanna, um, say hi to you, uh, not to Lucy, um, and, and thanks for, for coming, and let's, let's show her. Let's Great. Lucy. There she is. Hi, Thank Lucy. You. Hi. Yay. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, hi. Yeah, no, and especially, especially thank you for for uh, coming and um, uh, doing this. You know, I, I know that you're not allowed to travel because you're very pregnant. Um, it's true. And they won't so, let me on airplanes. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations on being very pregnant. That's very good. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's cool. Uh, particularly in light of the book. You know, I, I think I like that a lot. Um, so uh, I thought maybe we might start... Um, just a little talking about uh, your career up to this point, if that's okay. Sure. Um, and uh, if I'm doing my math correctly, you've been doing comics, uh, you know, like that have been published for about 10 years now. Um, this is your 10th anniversary, more or less, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's 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 pretty cool. And in that time, in in 10 years, you have five graphic novels out. Which seems like a tremendous number for 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 such a young cartoonist. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, and they're all good, so that that's even better. Um, uh, so, so comics are comics are pretty good for you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they've treated me very well. I've been very lucky. <laughs> so <laughs> they don't need to see me while she's answering. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm. You can, you can keep it on her for the most part. Um, uh, you've, you're, you're being published by uh, you know Simon and Schuster right off the, the, the bat with French Milk, um, uh, and then you've got Macmillan. I mean, those are two of the larger publishers of, of books in general in the world. Um, that's that's a pretty amazing place to start as a young cartoonist. Can you talk at all about how that came about? Certainly. Um... I think what happened was that I was entering the arena of comics right when all of the major publishing houses were sort of cottoning on to the fact that graphic novels were a thing and that this was going to be like a successful book publishing endeavor. So Simon & Schuster started a small graphic novel division and uh, in like 2005 and hired really smart people to run it and uh, sent these smart people out to indie comics festivals to sort of scoop up new talent and uh, didn't do any research about how to sell the books that they bought. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what happened was I was this like 20, I think I was 21 year old comic artist and I was at uh, the MoCA festival in New York City. Um, I had asked a friend of mine to let me put my books on the end of her table and, uh, and I had this self-published version of French Milk and the woman that they'd hired to head up the graphic novel division at Simon & Schuster came by and chatted me up at the show and picked up my book and like a couple weeks later I had a book contract and this was pretty amazing and unheard of and this was something that was happening in this like bubble of enthusiasm in the major publishing world for graphic novels where they would sort of <laughs> offer you a book contract I'd unseen and um, it was amazing for me, it was incredible, I'm so glad that they sort of kickstarted my career but they had no idea how to sell comics, they were only selling books in the past so they didn't know about selling them at shows or comic book stores or um, you know like getting it out to distributors they only knew how to sell books and so Simon & Schuster had this weird hiccup where these books didn't do as well as they had anticipated and they were like we're gonna just shelf this whole project <laughs> 
Um, so that was the start. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because here we are 10 years later, and, and I think I might argue that, that a lot of the publishers don't know how to sell the comics Still, <laughs> outside yeah. of, of bookstores, you know, and, yeah. and hoping that something works. Uh, uh, it's, I, I find that kind of funny sometimes. Um, it, 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 I can barely think of more than one or two of the New York book publishers who even know what a comic shop is, really, in any right. kind of real way. Mill is one of the few, you know, because of Gina. Uh, you know, Gina's pretty well involved with, with direct marketing. But it's, yeah, I think Macmillan did it right. They, you know, they really invested the time and the effort to get to know the industry and to reach out to uh, comics readers in a way that the bigger publishers might not have done so in, in, in the early days, earlier days, yeah. I should say. Yeah. Um, but Relish, your second book, went on to be a pretty big success uh, yeah. like commercially, you know, um, which yeah, is... Yeah, uh, New York Times bestseller, and it uh, won a bunch of awards, and it did really well. But that was under Macmillan and for a second, uh, mm -hmm. and they really um, take such good care of their authors and of their books and take the time to know the audience really well. And I, I'm so grateful to be working with them still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got to be a, a, a pretty heady feeling to you've published that yet in your career and then to have your second book, you know, where usually most people get the sophomore slump, to go on and be such a, a, a huge success uh, and such a wide success at that. Yeah, I, I'm grateful it happened that way, actually, because I feel like I would have been daunted by a, an earlier success. <laughs> <laughs> um so I guess that that brings us to something new. Um, I mean, we could talk about the other two books, but but let's let's talk about something new. Um, uh, this is this is a big book. This is the book. Um, it's, it's, Thank you for reading my 300 pages of feelings. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> we were talking about it a little bit before, and this is it's probably took me six seven hours to get through, which you know. I, mean, I read a lot of comics professionally. That's what I do, and, and uh, most graphic novels I can get through in two or three hours. So it's really kind of satisfying to get something that's that, that's much of a solid chunk. Nice. nice. How how was it for you to create such a dense work? I mean, it, it it looks to me like you did you turned this book around relatively fast, right? You did this in a, a year and a half or so. It am was I, I... a crazy deadline. Um, most of the book was written before the wedding, which happened in September, and then the whole book was done eight months after the wedding. Yeah. Um, so the, all the drawing, the inking, the coloring, the editing, everything, eight months later. It was an insane deadline. It was my own fault because I insisted on the 300 pages. They wanted, like, half of that. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, and I just got totally carried away. So uh, the next book is not going to be that long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you wrote it. You wrote it primarily before the wedding. Um, did you? So except for the parts about the wedding. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No. No. Obviously. Obviously. Um, uh, how how much of it was? Uh, trying to go for a length as a so in other words was it I'm doing a 300 page book or was it I've got a script that says it's a 300 page book if you understand the question it was more the second one okay. it was partly that I it just sort of kept unfolding and unfolding in the course of writing and creating the book that it started out where my publishers had an idea of what they wanted the book to be this sort of like DIY indie wedding kind of book for bride sort of thing and the more I got into the wedding industry the more abhorrent I found that concept <laughs> where I really didn't want to be part of this wedding industry that was trying to sell people something and tell people how they should be doing their wedding I wanted to really explore the history and the meaning behind a lot of the concepts and um, so in order to kind of partially appease my publishers and they wanted like a lot of the DIY stuff and a lot of the like fun wedding like food and stuff uh, while also making myself feel comfortable with the sort of content of the book it just kind of blossomed into this giant 300 page behemoth mm -hmm. well, yeah, it's, a, it's a big book it's a <laughs> So 
to, to, to draw all this in eight months, uh, that means you're doing, what's the, so you're doing more than a page a day, yeah? Yeah, I was doing something like, at one point, four pages of pencils and two pages of inks every day. Wow, how do you don't recommend how do you do that and do anything else? I mean to have a life at all or I didn't. shower or uh, <laughs> didn't do anything. <laughs> I just spent eight months like totally insane with this book and I remember thinking like this book about the wedding is really impacting my marriage at this point because I haven't like spent any time with my husband in the past eight months. <laughs> Funny that the book about the the wedding is impacts your, your marriage. Um, uh, what's your if 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 you're not under such a crazy deadline, what's what's your normal um, uh, like? Relish. Hmm, I think relish took me like three years, but I was also in grad school, and I was also sort of learning how I wanted to do graphic novels. And I was doing a lot of freelance to stay afloat. So this was really focused. I didn't take on any freelance work while I was doing it. And um, I think for my next book, I'm going to take like two years, hopefully a year and a half um, to make it. They say that they think it's going to be done in 2018, which I think is hilarious because I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> and I'm also going to be working full time. So. Um, yeah, sure. Twenty eighteen. Why not? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, it will take up some amount of your time. Uh, I heard they slow you down a little. Yeah. Just, just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a good way, but, but just a little yeah. bit. Um. Uh. So you, you work. Uh. I mean, at least from from your drawings about you working, you're, you're working traditionally. Uh. With with pen and ink. You're, you're not doing it on the computer. Yes. I work. Uh. Entirely pen and ink. I was doing the pencils. I started out doing the pencils digitally, and I found that I got really finicky with it, mm -hmm. and I didn't have the time. So I ended up having to just go straight onto the paper with like one of those clicky pencils, <laughs> and uh, and then then I would uh, scan it in and reverse it and print it out, and I would um, light box the other side of the paper. Uh, so it was it was sort of a blend, but it was almost entirely ink on paper, and then the colors were digital. Okay. Are you, you colored it yourself as well? I had a flatter, but I colored it myself, yeah. Okay. I can't understand how you did all this work in that amount of time, actually. I, I'm kind of flabbergasted by that. Yeah, it's pretty insane. <laughs> it's pretty insane, all right. <laughs> oh, I, I wow. really don't, don't recommend it. It's not a reasonable pace. I would, like... Every once in a blue moon, see other comic artists, and they'd be like, "What are you working on?" And I'd, I'd tell them about my deadline, and they would go, "You're insane! You're an insane person." But it's good in a way because it keeps you focused on a goal, you know. Yeah, it's really, it's, so, it's really you know, neat. one of the problems that I see with graphic novels a lot of times is you get a lot of people who who aren't that focused, and so they go, "I'm going to do this book," and they take four or five or six years to do the book. Right. Yeah, like Paul Paul. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's great when it finally comes out, but but you're like, six years? You could have done so much more. Right, yeah. And like you say, most graphic novels, you read them in like two, three hours, and you get through them, and you know when you find out that it took the author two or three years to make it, it's like, oh... So at least I'm I'm like up in the six hour range with this one. <laughs> are you still uh, are you still able are you still drawing through the late stage of your pregnancy or is there's so I much keep, of that which is being bent over a board? Right. Are, they I, keep I, pulling I, me back I, in. I keep trying to pull out. And they keep yeah. dragging me back in. So I I'm working on the next book, which is I'm at the writing and like sketchbooking stage of the book about pregnancy and sort of reproductive education um, because I'm living it and I'm studying it right now so I'm yeah. unable to not work on it but yeah a lot of the sort of shorter projects and freelance stuff 
I've been trying to put on hold, and of course, as soon as you put work on hold, everybody wants you all of a sudden after months of nobody wanting you. So now, of course, I'm getting all these like great freelance job offers, and I'm like, no, I can't take this. Um, but yeah, it's it's weird. Pregnancy is really weird. Like I have a uh, carpal tunnel now, which I, I like eight months drawing a 300 page graphic novel didn't give me carpal tunnel, but pregnancy has managed to do this. And uh, and yeah, it's like it's hard to bend over, and it's uh, it's like the baby kicks and the drawing goes flying away. <laughs> so it's like there's there's a lot of reasons to not be working like at that pace right now, but. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm doing a lot of sketchbook stuff, and I'm trying to write every day, and uh, in between the naps that I have to take. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're the first cartoonist that we've, the book club's been going on for almost a year now, uh, and you're the first cartoonist that we've had and who's doing autobiographical work, um, which you think we would have done somewhat by now, um, but this is this is the first. Um, I ask this question: Why, why, why autobiographical travelogue work? Um, why? Why? So I started out making comics when I was in college. I went to art school and I was going to be a painter. And I found myself in a new city, in a new environment. This kind of nerd in a super cool art school environment. And I didn't talk to anybody for like the first year that I was in school. And I had this little loft bed that I took my computer up to and I would just sort of sit there and draw comics and I started making comics about my experiences at the school and what I was going through and this sort of transitional period of going from child to adult when you start school and have a new city that you can call your own and uh, I started publishing them in the school newspaper and there were people that would respond to this uh, who felt similarly in school, and it became my way of kind of connecting to the reader and reaching out and having this shared experience. So this is why I still do this, is to have this shared experience and to feel connected to a reader in this way. And I think comics really lends itself well to that in this way that prose writing, you don't get it as well because you're just sort of reading the author's point of view. In a comic, you're not only reading it, you're seeing through their eyes how they remember it and how they can express it so fully, and it's this really controlled way of telling the story. Um, and I really love that. I really love reading true stories in comics because you get to see so clearly through the author's eyes, and I love that so much. And I, I loved these sort of true stories so long and <laughs> there was a point where I read Alison Bechtel's Fun Home which is an amazing book just wonderful and I remember that there was this really cool moment where I was reading the book and then you see this picture of her father and you see like oh you know I'm having this experience of what he is and who he was and Allison was having this experience of what he is and who he was through the writing of the book. And um, it was such an amazing visual moment that, uh, that I've, I tried to use photographs in my own work to a similar extent. But, um, but that's so cool. And then, like, extra layers later on, I saw the Fun Home musical where actors and directors were interpreting it on stage. And it was like this weird lack of control where Allison had told this very controlled beautiful story and then all of a sudden it was being interpreted by somebody else and it was like this weird moment for me where I was like no no you're gonna ruin it but uh, but it was wonderful and uh, I think that's so interesting the way that there's this interplay between truth and fiction and the reader and the author mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you think is in your own work, the the level of I guess truth versus truthiness, truth truth versus you know like literal truth versus what makes a compelling story as you're doing page. Well, I mean, there's a reason why comics aren't considered like documentary in in many cases. Uh, I think that the ability to have kind of a dual storyline happening where there's an interplay between the text and the image allows you to 
make visual jokes or interpret things uh, in visual ways that the text doesn't fully capture. So while I say that I'm very honest in my work, of course it's all very curated. It's all, it's all very um, controlled, as I mentioned earlier, that the story is very much my creation and, you know, while it's a true story, while it's honest and it's autobiographical, uh, I think that it, the, the, the medium of comics allows me to kind of have fun with telling this story. And I think that's why comics journalism is really interesting, too, because you are able to see someone's interpretation of the truth and someone's interpretation of how it happened, but at the same time understand that it's journalism, that it's um, research, that it's real things that happen to real people. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I find that a good a good piece of comics journalism, and, and I think as much as this is biography, I mean I would also call this a form of journalism at least. I mean you you took me to a place that I'm as as a nearly fifty year old man really know nothing about. I, I know nothing about planning weddings or <laughs> I, I got married at City Hall myself when I was nice. 21, so <laughs> this is really foreign to me. But I really felt, I really felt transported, and I really felt informed, oh, good. Um, which is which is what journalism should do, right? Um, so right. Uh, if if you if you're making a choice when you're when you're on the page, when you're when you're drawing, if you're making the choice between being as truthful as possible and and being as informative as possible is is that a choice that you're making or is that not a consideration? I don't know that there's a real division between uh, being honest and being informative. I think that there's a balance to strike certainly, but um, but I don't know. I I mean. What this book originally started as was sort of like relish for weddings, and uh, and what it became more was kind of relish for weddings, but also a little bit more like the travelogues that I had done in the past because it was so immediate and I was writing it as I was experiencing it. So there's a little bit of journalism to that, to, to the fact that it's so immediate, that it's not this kind of retrospective, contextual thing, um, that it was sort of on the ground writing it, but uh, but again, it became this very researched project, and I began to really research what wedding traditions meant, and what they meant historically, and what they meant to me personally, and uh, and I love that. I The next book I'm going to do, the one about uh, pregnancy and reproductive education stuff, is going to be super researched, but I mean, still hopefully really fun, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think there's a, I think there's, that's a thing that this book actually, I think. Um, I want to, I want to kind of turn to the audience here, and I want to see if any of y'all have any questions or thoughts that you want to. Okay. This is, this is a little intense to have a microphone. Um, so first off, Lucy, thank you so much for this book. Um, oh, as someone who's been in a relationship with my partner, we've been together now eight years, oh, and my nice. mom keeps saying, when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? And we're like, do you know what rent is in San Francisco? Not anytime <laughs> soon. Um, I really liked the research that you put into it. Um, a lot of these traditions, I come from a mixed heritage, and I know various traditions of one heritage, but not of the Anglo-Saxon heritage that I have. And so it's very interesting to how you went into some of these, these traditions and pulled apart the actual history behind it. Um, and for me, it made me appreciate it just a little bit more, you know, and be like, oh, the white is for this, or the solemn marching down the aisle. That's okay. That may, maybe doesn't resonate with me, but it's something that's, that's important. And I wonder, um, for you, how much of the research did you do pre-wedding, and how much did you do post-wedding? I think most of the research was pre-wedding, uh, just because I was trying to make all these decisions about the actual ceremony, and uh, I had a lot of familial pressure as well um, <laughs> from both sides, where people would ask me, like, what do you mean you're not going to wear a veil, or what do you mean you're not going to, 
you know, have your father just walk, walk you down the aisle, and I had to have a defense ready. <laughs> I had to, like, present my case with every stupid decision that I had to make for this whole stupid thing. And um, I was very happy to be planning my wedding, and I was very excited to be getting married, but uh, I felt like I had to compile this information so that I could get through it and stay sane. And uh, and I highly recommend it. I went to the library and I got a whole bunch of books on um, on like wedding traditions, and a lot of them were really dry and boring and um, crazy Victorian stuff. But uh, but I ended up learning a lot of really interesting things that I think helped me in the end to defend against people who would be like, oh, but you're not going to do the garter toss? That's my favorite part of weddings. And I'd be like, oh well, that's because you're a weirdo pervert, and here's why that. <laughs> is not okay, and why I'm not doing it at my wedding at all, no. Um, so, um, so you mentioned the uh, photographs. I mean, I found that I, I like, bookmarked uh, the one of, of, like, you walking in the rain and kept, like, as I was reading through different chapters, referring back to, to photographs that... Um, Work in the text just because they they like grounded like you can kind of get lost in because the um, a lot of the the book happens in in kind of like a mental like imaginary land as as much as uh, depicting the world that the the photographs like really like brought back as like this was like a, a physical event that we're telling the story of so I was curious if you could talk a little bit about um, the selection of those like if uh, if those were like anchors beforehand, or how you chose them uh, afterwards? Sure. Um, so I'm one of those people that when I read a book, I'm always flipping to the back of the page to look at the author photo um, so that I can kind of ground my visual learning in the reality of these people that are writing the book. And this is something I've done since I was a kid. And I remember the first time I read David Sedaris' book, I was like obsessed with looking at his picture and every sentence practically I'd flip back and be like, okay, that's him, that's him, he exists in a space in real life. Um, so that that's really been the motivation behind including these photographs. I love that there's this, this abutment of uh, my truth and the pho photographic truth. And um, one of the nice things about a writing a book about a wedding is that there's going to be plenty of photo journalism happening. There's going to be plenty of um, photos to choose from to include in the story. So I was very lucky that I could kind of have my choice of it. But um, I found it really fun to make the, uh, the kind of staged photos at the beginning of each of the chapters. Those were done after the fact. Um, and I wanted I wanted the, the kind of the chaos of the story, the chaos of the wedding, and the uh, ephemera of all of it, and the sort of arranged, perfectly organized um, uh, compilement of these objects to reflect back on the story that I was telling. So the um, those are those are all like staged after the fact, but I do include a number of photos from the actual wedding and the wedding planning process uh, because I really love that. I love the uh, that that interplay between my truth and the photographic truth, and I'm glad that you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I was I was uh, I was actually really struck by the use of the photography because I found that it, it punctuated each chapter very well. Okay. Oh, you, you know, I, I read the thing, and then uh, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of, of uh, the, 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 you know, where you find the, the cat toys, and then you get the picture of the cat toys, like <laughs> underlined, and here they really are. Um, yeah, that was that was really that was really strong. Did we have a, we had another question. Yes. Hi. Um, I feel like you addressed a lot of fears I have as a bisexual person in like a straight relationship um, and I was wondering how you feel about that now that you've been married. Gosh, I, <laughs> hmm. well one of the things that I've been dealing with since I got married is a lot of that identity shift stuff that you go through and I think that uh, getting pregnant 
as well has been like a pretty major shift in that regard. And I, you know, I have all these queer friends who, uh, who want to be parents, and it's like this really, really um, affecting time for me because I, I, I am in such a position of privilege that I'm in this relationship with this man that we were able to get pregnant, that um, we're going to be parents, and it's not going to cost us gazillions of dollars as as much as it would for my friends who are queer and it's it's something that I struggle with in my own identity quite a bit and I'm going to be talking about in the next book quite a bit more I think than even in this one but um, you know I think that it's total bullshit that, uh, that bisexuality is ever even questioned if if someone is in a heterosexual relationship and identifies as bisexual it's something that I have never questioned in myself that it would shake the foundations of that and who I'm attracted to and uh, and it's it's a little bit more difficult to connect with that part of myself now I have to admit that I'm in this very sort of societally accepted and like recognized situation where there's no question that people assume that I'm straight automatically but uh, that's why I'm sort of very adamantly stating it in my work uh, as much as possible and I state it publicly as much as possible and do what I can to support not only um, sort of the queer community but uh, queer authors and this is this is where like it gets really sticky as a person that makes books and struggles to um, work in a field where it's difficult to be successful like how much can you hold up people that you want to see more of. Like I, I'm constantly trying to champion these other artists at shows where um, people come up to me and they're like, oh I'm a like black queer zinester and I'm trying to make it and it's like okay we gotta get your book out there, we gotta get people's eyes on it but, um, but people are not getting published and this is where I kind of have to like nudge my publisher as much as possible and try and get those other voices out there because I, you know, I believe in my own voice, obviously, and I believe in my own identity, but I think that the most important thing I can do now from this position of privilege is to try and champion other voices and get those stories told, if I can possibly do anything to help that. And I hope that that kind of answers the question, other than just saying, like, it's always complicated and it's always going to be complicated. Um, but my, uh, my husband, obviously, uh, would never kind of negate any aspect of my own sexuality and uh, and we you know try and keep our friends well informed of who we are as people and uh, not care so much about what people who aren't our friends think of us follow up on that? Oh. <laughs> um, hi uh, so I have a question about um, well, one one thing, a statement. I really like how you depict your relationship with your mom throughout the book. Like, oh, obviously, thanks. it's a, yeah, obviously it's a wedding, so like tensions were heated. Yeah. Um, and as someone whose own mom loves uh, bridezillas and things <laughs> like other, like much uh, crazier situations happening, but like I like how you kind of show like almost every time that something really heated be came between you. Um, I was wondering how your mom um, thought about your book and like like how she was represented and stuff like that. She was pretty worried. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like I'm I have this policy of trying not to use comics to let it become a weapon or a tool of revenge of any kind. Um, I think that people are aware enough to know that they might show up in a comic and so I might get treated a little bit differently because of that which I'm gonna enjoy as much as possible but um, but yeah I, I try not to use it as, a, as a, a means to an end. I've gotten into trouble in the past here and there for that but um, I'm very careful about asking permission and um, showing people the work before it gets published if they're depicted in it and um, and trying to sort of show my friends and loved ones in the best possible light that I can. Um, that said, my mom is so unwavering in her support of me and my career that I'm like I could I could probably get away with a little bit more, um, which is why she's as she is in the book. I think um, 
tensions run very high at a wedding, and she's a caterer herself, and I'm an only child. And, you know, I just think that we were at odds for this whole period of time, this year of our lives. And um, I tried to tell that story honestly, but not make my mother furious. So she's okay with it. But she's, she was aware, like... During the course of me writing the book, she was like, am I the villain in the story? Am I the villain? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you're kind of the villain. You're kind of the villain of the, the whole thing. Yeah, you were kind of mean. <laughs> uh, but so was I, totally crazy. And uh, I hope that I'm being honest enough that it shows that I am equally as crazy as my mother in these situations. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought you did a pretty good job with showing... Like how, like when you're talking about all the stuff that you were handmaking for the wedding, like how obsessed you got over certain things, and how uh, everyone was like, you know, you didn't have to do all of that. Right. So yeah, I think you did a really good job with representing both you and your mom, just oh, good. like butting heads and being equally insane about weddings. So <laughs> I don't know what she says to her friends about this book. <laughs> Do, I, do you want me to move over? Okay. So hi, um, I've been reading your stuff for a number of years, and it's actually funny. I first encountered your books on one of those um, new releases things, Barnes and Noble or something like that, and so um, it was kind of fun to see uh, the book here. I just wondered, it's kind of follow up with the autobiography autobiographical nature. Do you find that people that you meet at shows and stuff? Um, know too much about, do you worry about people knowing too much about you or do, are people too familiar whenever you encounter them at um, like meet and greet kind of things? I'm, I've been very lucky <laughs> for one uh, that usually people are very sweet and friendly and usually more embarrassed than I am that they know things about my life but like I said the stories are all very curated uh, and it's very much you know, things that I'm willing to tell and willing to share and talk about. And so usually people come up to me and they're like, I know the name of your cat. Is that weird? And I'm like, no, let's talk about my cat. This is so great. Um, it's very, very, I find it very flattering um, when people know about my life, when they've read my work closely enough that they remember aspects of it. And, um, you know, what that usually means to me is that they've connected with me as a person. And I really love that. And, Something in my career that I've uh, I've managed to sort of work at is the the distance between myself as a as a person and myself as a character, and to represent myself as a character in this book and and puts a little bit of distance there so that I have a little bit of protection. <laughs> um, but I you know for the most part I think that I've been very very lucky with my readers and they're very respectful of me generally um, in terms of what they share uh, and you know I, I'm I'm particularly lucky because I tell stories about like cooking and weddings and travel and stuff where I have friends who write about their sex life in more detail and um, <laughs> I feel like, uh, you know, I've, I've tabled with my, my friend Erica Moen, who you guys probably know as, as West Coasters and comics enthusiasts. <laughs> um, we, uh, we'll, like, sit at a table at a show together, and I'll sit there, and people will come up and talk to me about my cat, and people will come up to talk to her about her pussy, and I'm like, <laughs> this is great. I You know, this is what we share in our work, and... Um, <laughs> we have very dedicated readers. This is so nice, but uh, but she's very comfortable talking to fans about her pussy, and I'm very comfortable talking to fans about my cat. So it works out. To to follow up on that a, a bit, that sounds weird actually. Um, do you do you feel any any pressure that so you're. you're I've done a book about your wedding, and you're about to do a book about your pregnancy. Do you do you feel that like this is where you, this is what you're doing now for the next 20 years? Like every every milestone Mining in your life, life is now public, and that's just how it is. Or or do you feel like you know the the book after that you could switch and make it about you know a school for alien hunters or something? You know. Well. I don't know. It's 
it's a balance between keeping your publisher happy and keeping yourself happy, of course. And uh, I'm actually working on another book at the same time I've been working on for years. And um, it's this really important book to me, and it's about high school. I went to four different high schools growing up. Um, I was a visual learner, and I was diagnosed with a learning disability. But I didn't have a learning disability. I was just an artist, and teachers didn't know how to teach to that. So um, I wound up at like learning disabled schools and in special ed, and I, I bounced from school to school, and I got expelled, and I flunked out, and I, I went through this really insane period. Um, but I made it out, and the way that I made it out was through art and arts education and art teachers. And um, so this is that story, and it's not like my other work in that my other work is very narrated and contextualized from me presently. This is more sort of told cinematically. Um, so I've been working on that book for like four years. And every time I get to a point where I'm like, okay, it's ready to be edited or it's ready to be drawn, I have this major life event and my publisher goes, no, 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 put that one on hold and make a book about your wedding or put it on hold and make a book about the baby. And part of me is like, ugh, I, but I want to tell this important story about the importance of arts education and um, something that's really uh, meaningful to me. But at the same time, I'm going through something that's also very meaningful to me and I want to be able to share it at the same time. So I I think that once the baby book is done, uh, I will hopefully be able to focus a little bit more on this book about high school, which is called New Kid, and, um, and be able to have a little bit more freedom to tell a more serious story. And part of what irks me a little bit is that I have this very domestic trajectory in my career going on right now, which is never something I thought I would see for myself. I have a book about cooking and getting married and having a baby now, um, which is very kind of confusing to me, but at the same time, to have had that my own reaction to it where I was like, why do I have all these books about lady shit? I was kind of like, well, why should lady shit be thought of as any worser than telling a story? that, uh, you know, that is about, you know, this kind of lofty goal of telling a story about arts education, like why should things that are traditionally thought of as feminine pursuits uh, be considered lesser than. So I, I really examined my own feelings about that and I really want to tell these stories in a way that uh, makes them universal and talks about them from a feminist perspective and I think that that's very cool and I'm very into doing it right now. So. Uh, so again, this is like keeping myself happy, keeping my publishers happy, and telling stories that I feel very strongly uh, should be told. No, I, I, I think you have succeeded in that. Um, um, so I have like a bunch of questions. Some of them were brought up, you know, like relationship with your mom and all that. But I, you, you kind of touched at the last point with your relationship with your publishers. And how does that work where it seems like you're close with your publishers when it was at your wedding and how, or your editor and how does that work? Are, are they coming to you mining and saying, hey, Lucy, what, what you going through today? Like Maybe that could be what's it like <laughs> buying a new fridge, um, which honestly, if you do that, I would read it. But it's, it's one of those things like how does that relationship work, especially when so much of your material, almost all your material is you know autobiographical. You know, you have the, the research and everything. But it is you and your relationship with this. So, you know, I'm not a writer or an artist, but I just want to hear your take on that. Sure. Um, so I have, I have a really good relationship with my editor. Um, she's awesome. And I also have a really good relationship with my agent. Um, I got an agent when I was 21, and I had been offered this book contract, and I had no idea how to read it. So I went online, and I, like, Googled... Um, who is Alison Bechtel's agent? Like, what, how do I, what do I do here? And um, this woman's name came up who had worked with Alison as a publicist, but she was just getting into agenting. And I was like, well, I'm just getting into publishing, so <laughs> we should get together. And I wrote her an email that I think, like, I had my mother proofread. I was like, <laughs> how do I write to an agent? I wrote to an, this agent, and I was like, hey, I've done most of the work here, actually. I have this contract already. Um, would you 
mind being my agent and helping me and just making sure that this contract isn't like stealing my soul. So uh, she was very kind and she was like, yeah, I'll totally do this. This is great. You are now my client. We're This is fine. Um, and I've been working with her ever since. So we've had this like 10 year relationship and she's amazing. And one of the things that a really good agent does is tells you not only like what what you want to do that would be great for you, but what your readers would really want to see from you possibly and, um, and, and makes that happen for you. So part of it is that I have, a, I have a great agent who's really awesome and nice to me and like gets me really drunk sometimes. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like she like gets information out of me that way. <laughs> um, and then I have this really good publisher uh, who I love working with. I have, I have a few publishers that I work with, but um, my, my main one uh, who I worked with for Relish and um, Something New and I'll probably work, on for, work with um, the baby book um, is this woman, Callista Brill, who works for First Second. And um, what was cool is that I was going in to talk to her about about the high school book, about the this book, and we were uh, we started having these conversations. And usually our conversations just totally degenerate into like, oh my god, did you see the last episode of Sherlock? And then we talked about <laughs> that for like 45 minutes, and like these are our professional meetings. <laughs> and um, at the at at this one meeting, we were meeting to talk, and uh, I had just gotten engaged, and I had just sort of started learning about the wedding industry and how crazy it was and she had gotten married a couple years before so she was like yes I dealt with a lot of the same stuff that was totally insane here's a story that I have here's a story that you have and um, so out of that we kind of came to the idea of this book together and um, and that's really awesome and what's cool is that she just had a baby like three weeks ago or something so, <laughs> so she went through this like just ahead of me and now I'm going to go through it. And so what's great is that I'm working with this person who is, like, just ahead of me and understands everything that I'm talking about. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. I do. I do. This one's kind of tricky. This one's I, – I, I'm, I'm wondering how to phrase this. So it seems okay. like you're pretty honest uh, in your work and you're – like, you were showing the fights with your mom, you know, showing – the, the tricky parts of your relationship uh, with your husband or at the time your boyfriend and whether or not you want to have kids and it seemed like you did a really good job through all of it um, kind of balancing your identity or the, the kind of warring sides, right? You know, I want to give in to society because this is what I've been told forever and I would make such a pretty bride <laughs> but at the same time, like, fuck that and we're, sorry, I don't know if I can say yeah. that. Um, Fuck that, you know. <laughs> I don't know what children are watching this. Um, <laughs> very strange kids. Um, very educated kids. Um, so, but it seemed like when it came to the part where you wanted to have a baby and your boyfriend didn't, that part seemed to be a lot more the onus was on you for, for wanting to have that baby and you didn't have the research and everything. And I wonder if you could just kind of talk where so much, and I think you're a rational person, that might be part of it, right? So much of what you believe in is, is based on evidence and, and facts and research and stuff. But it just seemed unfair to me that throughout the whole rest of this book, you're, you're doing such a good job of balancing these these two different desires. But then when it came to you with this baby thing, you're like, yep, I just want a baby and it's unfair. You know, and I, that's very tricky, and I don't want to be disrespectful of you and your relationship and, and all the arguments that, you know, don't fit into one chapter, a um, few cool. panels on a page, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a whole other book that's coming <laughs> to a bookstore. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was something that, you know, I, I kind of suspected that I would be doing a book about it in the future. Okay. Uh, it's something that I always really wanted to write about is uh, is this stuff like I, I talk about the book in the book I talk about how I wanted to be a midwife when I was a kid like I yeah. wanted to uh, be an OBGYN and it really fascinated me and uh, you know we're never really sure where these fascinations come from as a kid so part of it was just that I was like I'm going to get to figuring that out in a later book <laughs> but um but for like for this wedding book, like this is sort of a side plot, and yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's something I'm gonna be exploring a lot more, okay. and I'm certainly exploring a lot more like presently in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, uh, yeah, and I didn't want to speak for my husband so much. Like, this is, again, I'm, I'm willing to tell the story from my perspective. It's very much my story, and I didn't want to be like, okay, here's how he came to the conclusion that he wanted to have kids. Like, I don't, like, he, he's explained it to me, and I still don't really get it. Um, so it's my own question. But I'm like, here, here I'm having a kid, so... Um, but uh, but as far as my own feelings about it go, go I think that um, this identity stuff is is so complicated, and it's going to be something that you balance with society's expectations, and you balance with your own childhood and the way that your parents related to you as a kid, and having kids of their own. And uh, it's something that needs like more space, uh, needs a longer book to yeah. talk about. I think um, so. That's what that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is there another one inside the room? So um, it's interesting because I I almost thought it, at the beginning of the book there was a moment that I actually thought that John was the bad guy. <laughs> Like I'm like, why is he breaking her heart in this way? <laughs> was was that was that was that difficult to put in the book, or or was it easy because you knew that it had a happy ending? Um. Well, I think it was mostly funny for me at the time <laughs> because, like we broke up in this very rational manner and we had this very like rational breakup and we were always on very cordial terms even when we were broken up and it's to me it's very romantic to tell this kind of unromantic story and I really like to to kind of flip that on its head to not tell the traditional kind of like oh we met and we fell in love and then I started thinking about my wedding like the reason why this book exists is because we were in love, but we were very much not together, and I wasn't considering it at all, and all of a sudden we were engaged, and it was like, these two kind of, frankly, unromantic people were in this very romantic situation, where suddenly we were both like, oh, um, okay, all right, romance, here we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, so that's, I mean, that's the kind of the onus of the book, is that, uh, you know, John and I split up at, at the beginning, basically, and um, you get to sort of see these two people fumble blindly uh, through the world and and then go through this very romantic experience together. And, I, you know, I think it's a very romantic story, but between two very practical people. Um. The only other thing I, I well, actually, there's two other things I want to say. So, so one, my favorite story. I say, you, well, my favorite part in this book was, but uh, I have to say, my favorite, the, the favorite anecdote in the book was, was your, was your James Bond bachelorette party that you threw for, for her. But how cool is that? Yeah. that is, I wish, I wish I was your girlfriend so I could go to that because yeah. that sounds fucking cool. It so, was amazing. Whatever else, fucking cool for that. It was really cool. It was really cool and totally over the top and insane. And all the other bachelorettes thought that I was a lunatic. And I was like, that's fine. Think that about me. It's fine. How long did something like that come, take you to come up with, like, like writing clues and writing a script? And, oh. A year, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, like a year. It was insane. So, uh, there, you know, she'd get this, like, envelope that was marked top secret and it had all these initial clues and it had, like, a decoder ring in it. And, like, it was... It was insane, and at the time, I think that, uh, the, you know, this is one of my oldest and dearest friends, and we saw each other every week, and I was living in New York, I wasn't really dating, I was doing freelance, and I this was really my first time that someone close to me had gotten married and I had been part of the wedding party, so I was like, I have all this extra, like, creative <laughs> libido to put somewhere, and I'm going to pour it all into this crazy bachelorette idea, and it was insane. I mean, it, the whole thing was insane. The puppet thing that I did, I like, had puppets made of them, 
And then I took the puppets on my book tour <laughs> so that I could have the puppets filmed in, like, different locations. And, it, yeah, I, I have not had the energy to do that <laughs> since that wedding. Um, yeah, the last time I was in a wedding was for my sister-in-law. And, like, we just had a very traditional wedding, and there was a stripper. And I was scandalized. <laughs> Um, because I'd only ever been to super nerdy bachelorette parties where we've, like, done mystery solving and stuff like that. My own one, which was, like, ABBA-themed. Yeah. Uh, that's, no, that's amazing. Uh, and then the other thing that I just, I wanted to sort of just draw attention to is I, I, I really, I really admire your cartooning. I really admire a lot of the little details, silly stuff in the background. My, I think my favorite joke in the entire book, and it's such a throwaway joke, but it literally made me stop and laugh out loud, is on page 200, when you when you draw the map of, of U.S., uh, of Chicago to, to where the wedding was, and you have the little legend, and it's, maps are hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, it made me laugh. It made me oh, laugh. So that, from a craft point of view, uh, this is a beautiful book. Oh, um, I think the last question I want to ask you before before we go here is um, there's a picture of you when you're I'm going to guess you're seven or eight um, uh, reading an Archie comic in New York. Um, mm -hmm. Can you can you talk at all about your earliest introduction to comics and and what you were reading and and how as a as a you know young girl in the '90s you were you were exposed to comics. And what made you want to do comics as a result? I didn't come to wanting to do comics until I was really old. But I was obsessed as a kid, so it was weird. It was this weird disconnect. Um, I started reading comics when my parents split up, which I find really interesting because my mom was a caterer, but she also made, she was like a painter and she made visual art. And my father uh, worked in business, but he was also a, literature professor and he's he's now he's like the dean of liberal arts at a, at a college so um so he was very much the words guy and my mom was the pictures guy, girl and uh when they split up i started going to the local um shop and buying archie comics and uh and reading them and it really didn't click for me until years later that I was finding this way to combine the drawn image and the written word in a way that allowed me to kind of have both of the things that my parents had instilled in me. Uh, but it pissed them both off completely. It, like, my father thought that comics were really unintellectual and stupid and wouldn't teach me anything, and my mother thought that uh, Archie comics specifically were very sexist and um, that like Archie was this disgusting playboy and these two girls were fighting over him all the time. So um, so I was in this position where I really loved these comics and I had to defend them to my parents so that they would continue to buy them for me. And um, so it made me look at these comics in a really critical way where I had to be like, hey, Dad, do you know how I learned that word? It was from an Archie comic. And uh, <laughs> I have to be like, hey, Mom, you know, this in this story, like Betty and Veronica ditch Archie and they go to the beach together. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how I started looking at comics really critically. And I had this huge collection of like long, block, long boxes of Archie comics. Uh, that was the envy of all my friends, and I really loved them, and I had subscriptions, and I'd get them in the mail, and it was so fun. And uh, when I was in high school, I got into more um, sort of like I would go to the comic shop every week, and I would pick up my orders on Wednesday. And I read uh, Strangers in Paradise was my um, my jam at the time, which is so good, and I like I'm still like in mourning about it. Um, but I also read a lot of uh, I started getting into like a lot of the Vertigo titles and the Valiant titles a little bit and, uh, and sort of just becoming interested in this stuff. And my mom had a weird boyfriend, too, who was like a, like a, a weird comic book collector guy, and he would take me to the comic store sometimes, and he'd really, really try to, like, get me into um, weird superhero titles that he really liked. And sometimes it would kind of work and sometimes it wouldn't, but... Um, but yeah, I remember 
I remember that he was like friends with the comic store guys, and he and the comic store guys were all these like weird '90s comic store guys. Uh, <laughs> and then there was this like nine-year-old girl who was like, "Yeah, okay, I'm hanging out with these guys. This is fine." Um, and I would buy Pogs and stuff too because that was awesome. That's where you <laughs> bought them. And uh, you know, the comic book stores were clearly the such a different animal than they are today, and still like wonderful, wonderful places. And it's so great to see their evolution and to see uh, how much, how many more titles there are that are specifically geared towards young girls and uh, how much more welcoming these places are and how like less weird <laughs> dudes are yeah. in these places. Um, so I sure. like, yeah, I, in, in most cases at least. But, uh, but yeah, and then, you know, I, I, uh, my parents started to like cotton onto the fact that this comics thing wasn't going to go away. I started reading Hergé and uh, Asterix and Obelix stuff and, um, every once in a while I'd lay hands on something that was totally above my age group and and my parents didn't know and I would just have to be like, oh, there's naughty things in this comic and <laughs> just won't let anybody know about that. Um, but I, I thought that I would always have to choose between art and writing. It was this weird uh, thing for me where I thought that I would always have to choose kind of between these two disciplines that my parents had instilled in me. I thought I would have to be a writer or an artist. and um, when I had all this trouble in high school and I had terrible grades, I was like, well, I can't be an, a writer because you have to, like, go to a good college for that. <laughs> but I could probably be a visual artist, and that's why I ended up in art school wanting to be a painter and then realized immediately, oh, I don't have to sacrifice writing. I can be a writer and an artist through comics, and this way I don't have to sacrifice anything. This is both. This is so great. Um, but it was too late because I was in a four-year fine arts program <laughs> and there was no escape. After four different high schools, my parents were like, you have to stay at the school for four years. And I was like, all right, fine. Um, but fortunately, I, I was able to kind of cobble together a comics education and I went on to go to the Center for Cartoon Studies uh, to finish that out. And now this fine arts school where I went to be a painter and they sort of didn't get the comics thing has like a great comics program. It's the, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and now they have this whole mm. comics program that makes me like furious and bitter every time <laughs> every time I hear something new about it. I'm like, oh, isn't that nice? Did your, did your dad finally come around on comics? Uh, he's very excited that I'm in the publishing world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that he would be maybe more beside himself if I was like a prose publisher, but uh, but he's very excited that I that I've been published by like publishers. Um, he, you know, he he doesn't quite get the like the fanographics books that I've done. He's a little bit more like, hmm. but uh, but yeah, he's really psyched that I'm published and that I have like events at bookstores and. Um, that's a very big deal for a literary professor, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I we've been following your career for for a long time, and and I just we love what you do. Thank you. Love your work. Keep doing it. I, I want to thank you very much, particularly for something new. Um, thank you very much. Uh, right. Thank you guys for your questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you, Lucy. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us tonight, and uh, and we, we look forward to everything you do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully it won't take me more than two years. <laughs> uh, it's okay, because you'll, you'll have that new life to take care of, so that's yeah. maybe more important. You know? <laughs> It'll be good fodder, at least. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Thank you very much. Before we, before we quit, I would just not not to you necessarily specifically, Lucy, but uh, our next month's book is um, is Dark Knight, a true Batman story, um, which is actually an autobiographical comic as well. Um, it's it's by Paul Dini uh, and about when he got mugged um, and how he dealt with being mugged uh, through Batman, which is it's it's really an interesting piece of work. So that's next month, and we're gonna have Paul Dini live and in person um, here, which should be pretty darn cool. So, thanks very much, and see y'all. See ya. Bye. Thanks, guys.